Welcome to Impact Pasadena, and we're delighted to have as our guest the mayor of Pasadena, Terry Tornick. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Mayor. I'm happy to be here. We've uh, talked in an earlier segment about some of the challenges and some of the vision for uh, Pasadena going forward. Uh, we've talked about education, and housing, economic growth, and some of the other uh, challenges that we see every day in Pasadena. I also want to talk about a few other issues that, that, that come up in, in, in talking to people around town. Um, one is it that we have some communities here that are that are challenged. There's you know economic challenges for people. There are housing challenges, and I know that the city has limited resources to solve social problems and, and serious economic problems. But what do you see as the role of the city in, in in helping some of our less privileged residents? Well, I think the city, as you as you say, has limited resources and ability to influence some of these outcomes. I think. Um, one of the earlier things we talked about was economic development and the most important thing the city can do is I think is to encourage uh, employers to come to town that can put money in people's pockets uh, that can provide jobs uh, at a decent wage hence the minimum wage discussion um, and and allow them to uh, improve their their circumstances mm -hmm. in terms of physical development in some of the uh, areas north of the freeway where there's been less intensive development, uh, that's a market-driven activity. We had bigger opportunities to influence outcomes there when we had the redevelopment tool. That's gone. Uh, our friend the governor uh, took that away from us. Uh, and that's limited our ability to have a direct influence in terms of acquiring property and and uh, selling it and you know uh, having an influence in that kind of development but the the good news there is that um, that development on of its own accord uh, Pasadena has become a valuable enough place where uh, now we're starting to see private development activity north of the freeway mm -hmm. that in turn will bring uh, its own challenges because then what will happen is that there'll be certain people that feel that the development that's being proposed uh, will lead to gentrification displacement of people that have lived in town for a long time Absolutely. and they'll be right yeah. so <laughs> once again we're confronted with that kind of um, not being able to you know square the circle uh, you want to have development you want to have um, new activity and new opportunities but at the same time you don't want to necessarily push aside long-term residents um, and that's a challenge uh, not just in Pasadena but uh, across the region and across the country and it's something that we're going to start to see, I would predict, uh, uh, rear its head in the not too distant future. Yeah, and, and I think that we touched on in the last segment, housing and affordability. And, and we're not getting a lot of help from the state or the feds in terms of affordable housing. I mean, that's probably an understatement. Well, I mean, the, the, the feds um, really, and I, my first job um, when, I, when I came out of the Army was with the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Mm -hmm. And uh, the feds over the years have had very robust housing programs. The feds have basically bailed uh, in terms of providing housing resources, with the exception of the Section 8 program, the voucher program, yeah. which provides um, direct assistance to people to go out in the marketplace and find their own, own uh, apartments. And then it subsidizes that, that, that rent. The problem with that is that the, even there, the feds have fallen down because they have set the rent levels at such unrealistically low levels that people have these coveted certificates in their hands and they can't find a place to live. So um, our friends in Washington don't have a lot to offer and, and ironically, or I don't know if it's ironic, but, but one of the, one of the um, impacts of the proposed uh, uh, tax cut program is to eliminate the tax credit bond programs that have been one of the few remaining resources to help us produce new housing. So the picture from, uh, from Washington is not very bright. And um, as far as Sacramento is concerned, they really have never offered very much in the way of direct resources to us. Right. All they do is impose um, requirements on us uh, without any, any real way to, to meet the requirements. And now they're preempting local zoning and land use controls, which is something that I'm very bitter about and uh, uh, feel is, is a, in an effort, which I think is well-intentioned, to help address some of, some of uh, the statewide housing problems that we have, doesn't make any distinction between a city like Pasadena, which has 
made an honest effort and a somewhat successful effort in meeting the housing needs of its citizens and some other communities, which I don't need to identify specifically right now, that have actively avoided uh, providing any additional housing, particularly affordable housing. Well, you know, uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit later in this segment about the role of cities, uh, the, the challenges that cities are facing in, in light of, as you put it, uh, Washington kind of bailing on us uh, and where, what the new role is for cities uh, and, and, and the importance of, of localism. And, and well, let's other talk things about it now. Do. Okay, go I for mean, it. I mean, I think that, that um, what's interesting to me as a sort of a student of government mm -hmm. is, is that um, increasingly, and transportation is the is the probably the best example. Um, I, in an earlier life, I ran a regional transit authority, and so I'm really familiar with the transportation programs that the feds used to have. Um, a lot of those, have, just like in the housing arena, the, the federal government has has withdrawn from that arena. And if you look at at um, the regions across the country, the urban areas that have made serious progress in terms of introducing mass transportation across the country. Those have all come from local initiatives. And the fact that the taxpayers uh, in Los Angeles County were willing to tax themselves with Measure M in order to support transportation improvements, which frequently or typically would have been funded from the federal level and is no longer funded, the fact that the, that the, uh, the voters in Los Angeles County were willing to impose a sales tax in perpetuity on themselves in order to fund transit activities is an illustrative example of where local and, and regional government has had to fill the void uh, that has been created by the withdrawal of the federal government. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think if you just look in terms of the metro, which I think has been largely a success, maybe it's not financially a success, but you can't, the, the, uh, these mass transit systems really can't pay for themselves. No, never have. Yeah. But, but what I saw, and I, I'm sure you observed this too, is the elected officials, the uh, grassroots folks, uh, doing a coalition so that you could get resources from Washington, from, from all sorts of areas. So I, w would you agree that the metro has been a, a positive, uh, particularly oh, for no Pasadena? Question. Look, I, I, you know, I grew up in Brooklyn, um, <laughs> and all I knew was mass transportation. I never owned a car until we left New York when I was 21 years old. Right. Um, and so it, it, uh, um, I, I know about mass transportation. I've always relied on mass transportation. Yeah. I never felt, as I'm not a very good predictor of the future sometimes, <laughs> but I never felt that, that this region would have a serious uh, mass transportation system for a whole host of reasons. Yeah. You know, so auto dependent and the abandonment of the red car system and you know, all the stuff that you know about. Um, and yet, we now have a, 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 a credible um, rail system, light rail system, and regional transit system that's, that's yeah. emerging and evolving. And it's really quite remarkable. And, uh, and I think it, it has been successful. It's, it's not successful in, in terms of people's expectation that suddenly if, if people started climbing on the, on the gold line or the expo line, that the freeways would yeah, empty exactly. out, you know. Yeah, clear uh, up. And it's still, a, it's really in terms of the total number of, of transit trips made in the region. It's a very modest number, a small percentage of the trips made. But it seems like younger people, I know the PCC students use it heavily and... Uh, Our granddaughter get, yeah. uh, is a PCC student, um, is 19 years old, doesn't have a driver's license. My, doesn't uh, want a driver's license. I have a friend at Caltech uh, who has a uh, eight-year-old son, I believe, or six-year-old son, and he said, my, uh, my son will never drive a car and uh, autonomous vehicles. Yeah. Between, between the, uh, the shared ride, you know, Ubers and Link, yep. uh, um, and the, and the uh, uh, autonomous vehicles that are coming in the much sooner than people think they are, um, the challenge for the transportation planners in this region is how to incorporate those services uh, with fixed rate rail and, and mm -hmm. buses and mm -hmm. really create a coherent transit system that will serve uh, people who don't live within blocks of, of some, some, uh, some rail system. And we should say that the 710 freeway is, uh, will not and never could be a solution to these problems. No, the, seven, so. the 710 freeway was a sort of an early 20th century solution. Um, and happily, I, I suppose it's one of the, the, every cloud has a silver lining. I mean, one of the positive aspects of the reduction in federal assistance uh, is that there was no way 
that even the most avid proponents of, of the uh, completion of the 710 freeway could ever foresee an opportunity to get it funded. Yeah. And so uh, it died of its own weight uh, rather than because of the successful opposition that many people mounted to it. Um, and now we have the opportunity to really begin to address the transportation needs of this region in a, in a coherent way and in a 21st century way. I attended a meeting this past week in Supervisor Barger's office, mm -hmm. uh, which was attended by Pasadena, uh, South Pasadena, and Alhambra uh, joining together um, in an effort to try and find alternatives absent the completion of the 710 that would meet the, the travel needs of our citizens working at it together yep. in creative ways. And it was such a, I mean, C Catherine Barger, the supervisor, said it was almost brought her to tears to see, <laughs> you know, the three cities uh, that had been duking it out yep. for, for so many years working now collegially um, in an effort to, to really meet the transportation needs of all of our cities. Yeah, which I think is what happens when you have to address the future, uh, when, it, when it arrives. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, about the environment, um, but just before we leave transportation, we hear people, um, and you know, it's scattered, but you hear people complaining about traffic. And um, I, I, I looked at some of the statistics that actually you had presented in your state of the city last year, and although traffic times have increased slightly, it still takes about eight minutes to get from, look, so, I, so I, I, I want to, let's put this to rest. Look, there, there, there are traffic jams in Pasadena. Yeah, yeah. And if you try to go cross town on California Boulevard at 515 or go south on Los Robles um, at 515, it, you're not going to flow freely. Yeah. It's, it's congested and it's going to take you some extra time. 22 hours a day, um, you can flow freely. And when I look, I was at, a, at an appointment in, a, in an office on Lake Avenue um, yesterday in the, uh, you know, at about 10 a.m. and I had views of Lake Avenue and of, I guess, Cordova and there, it, there were no cars on the street. I mean, you know, it, it's, it is true that for people who um, are accustomed to never having any traffic in the city, that mm -hmm. having to encounter any traffic is, is a significant change and an irritant uh, and is certainly present in certain times of day on certain streets. Yeah. Um, but really, it's a very small price to pay in terms of the kinds of activities that, that uh, we're having Yeah, it always here. seems to be a kind of a hot button issue for Southern Californians. All they want to do is talk about traffic and traffic transportation. And parking. And parking. What else is there? Parking, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think there are other things. And one of them I want to talk about is, um, is our open spaces, our recreation, our environment. Um, I know you've been active in, in a number of areas there. What do you see as the, uh, sort of going forward, what are you looking at in terms of improving our, our, uh, our recreation possibilities and open spaces? Well, one of the things that the council has been um, unsuccessful in doing is um, finding uh, additional open space in the central district. Mm -hmm. The central district has been the recipient of the most of the growth that we have encouraged that we've planned for in terms of multifamily developments, uh, but we haven't developed any additional open space. We've been collecting fees for that open space, but we haven't actually identified mm -hmm. any open space uh, to add to our open space inventory. And all those apartment dwellers and condo dwellers deserve to have some open space as well that's within walking distance. Happily, we're about to change that. We've identified a site, and my fingers are crossed that we'll be able to uh, create the first brand new open space in, in the central district in, the, in living memory. Um, we have, uh, we really have a nice open space network of parks and open spaces. We've been working with the school district. Those are open spaces as well. You know, those, those school properties that are typically locked up when the schools are not in session really should be available open spaces. So we have some what we call joint use agreements on some of the school sites to make them available to the to the uh, to residents in non-school hours that's another resource so we need to buy additional park space we need to open up some of the school sites and we need to do a better job in managing our existing open space resources and of course the one that i've been focused on since last year state of the city uh, is the arroyo the arroyo is our sort of living beating 
uh, open space heart. And um, it's a thousand acres, nearly a thousand acres. It's really a remarkable resource because it, it, it extends from the foothills all the way to South Pasadena and then down the Los Angeles River, you know. Kind of historic uh, as well. It, it, terrific. And, and it, it offers such a variety of recreational opportunities, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, whether, whether you're a horseback rider in Hahamanga or a disc golf, you know, yeah. uh, player, the first disc golf uh, course in the country, or you're, you're a, a, just a person who likes to walk around the Rose Bowl, or an archer, yeah. or you know, I mean, whatever it is, yeah. you can do. You can find a place to do that in the yeah. Arroyo, but it or just a hiker. Uh, I mean, most of the way that Maria and I use the uh, the Arroyo was just to, to hike around, just mm -hmm. to have some respite. And okay. and the amazing thing is that you can find yourself on a trail in the Arroyo, um, and not even realize that that you're in the city anymore. It's yeah. literally yeah. you can really feel lost and like you're in the forest. Yeah. And that's an amazing thing to be able to say in this day and age, and, and it's part of what makes Pasadena an attractive city to newcomers because there is this easy access uh, to open space. And, um, and so we need to do a better job in how we manage that space, how we support it and nurture it, improve it, um, what we decide is suitable for it and what's not, what to encourage, what to discourage. Mm -hmm. and, and in the typical Pasadena fashion, we've uh, we've asked a citizen task force with a lot of talented, imaginative people to take a look at that uh, for us and help us come up with some ideas on what we should be looking at and how to pay for it. Well, on that subject, <laughs> I'm going to change to a less, a less joyous topic, which is something that I know you spend a lot of time on, which is the finances of our city. Um, and I would say, looking at it as a layperson from afar, we're doing pretty well, but we really have some challenges and they're coming up. So could you give us a brief overview of where we are? I know that in your State of the City, which is coming up on January 16th, I believe, um, you'll be talking in depth about it. And I really encourage all of our uh, passing the citizens to go and, and, and hear from you about that. But could you give us a little bit of a, bre a brief on that? Well, the brief is that um, we are doing well. We've, we've been living within our means. We've, we've tightened up on um, the number of employees we have and, and the number of activities we're trying to undertake. You know, cities are not good at saying no. So when, when someone comes to us with a worthy idea, uh, the immediate um, desire is to do it. Uh, the, the problem is that you have to, you have to pay for it. Yeah. And uh, so while we have been living within our means and tightening our belt, um, and we've even been building, rebuilding our reserves, which we had depleted significantly. Uh, the future, starting in next fiscal year, starts to look tougher. And that's as a res in spite of the fact that, that we have new development and our property tax continues to increase, our transient occupancy tax, uh, the hotel, you know, from, from the new hotels continues to grow. Uh, but some of our other revenue sources are not growing. Um, utility user tax and, and is not growing. Mm -hmm. And so we're confronted with the reality that we're not going to be able to support our current level of services starting next year with the amount of money that we have. That's just the truth. And so we have a couple of choices. We either have to find new ways to raise revenue, uh, and I'll be talking about that at some length uh, at my state of the city. Um, that's the tease. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and uh, we also have to find additional ways to um, to save money. And unfortunately, um, I think we've just about picked all the low hanging fruit. I mean, we've really I don't know which metaphor to use, but yep. we've kind of wrung it dry. And now when we begin to reduce expenses, it's going to be at, at the cost of reducing services that people have come to expect. Mm -hmm. And that is always a challenge. Um, and so I think we need to be somewhat creative about how we go about this. And uh, the state of the city address is supposed to be the mayor's message to the people per the charter on what the budget should look like and what the major themes of the budget are to be. Mm -hmm. And that's what I intend to do. The, the past two years have been to create kind of a primer for people to explain to them how the budget works. We even had an exam in year one. <laughs> um, but this year it's going to be about some proposed solutions. And um, not all of them are going to be, are going to be uh, I would predict that not all of them will be greeted with open arms. 
So um, just to back up a little bit on the challenges, can you kind of explain briefly the CalSTRS, CalPERS, and Cal and the STRS uh, pension issues that have come up and yeah, what the, our the, options are? I don't think we have the, a lot the, of options. The but. problem that we have is that our, our we have a budget of about, general fund budget of about $230 million. And about for years, about $30 million of that um, has been what the city has had to allocate to pay for our responsibilities toward the retirement of our employees. Mm -hmm. Our employees are talented people. Some of them have, ex have accepted uh, reduced compensation levels in return for having a stable work opportunity and a, a good retirement. Yeah. But our retirement system in CalPERS is a fixed benefit plan, which means that unlike a 401k, which is determined by, you know, you put the, the amount of money in, uh, but what you ultimately get out of it depends on what your investments look like. Right. In, the, in the fixed benefit format, the city, through the state system, is guaranteeing you a payout over time. And the way, Calster, the way CalPERS and CalSTRS, the, the teacher's version of it, uh, has funded that is that they make investments in the market. Sometimes investments are up and sometimes they're down. Yeah. So our cost, the city's cost from the general fund that has to be devoted to the pension expense is going in a, over a five-year period from 30 million to 65 million, mm -hmm. nearly doubling, right. and more than doubling. And that is happening out of a budget that's only about 230 million. So you can see Ten, that it's a, it's a big chunk of what we've got, and right. that doesn't pay for current service. That right. pays our obligation for the services we've already received. And, and probably most people don't realize that our public safety of police and fire are really more than 50% of our budget of our 50, general fund. 53%. Yeah, um, there you go. And um, that's actually low by, by some standards, some, okay. some city standards. Okay. But um, this burden, it, it's not the only uh, issue that's confronting us in terms of the revenue curve and the, and the uh, expense curve crossing in an unfavorable way. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is a big chunk, and it's a lot to absorb all at once. Um, and it's not likely to get better. And so we've got to develop some, apart from tightening the belt further to a point where really it poses problems in terms of what people, people expect as basic services, um, we need to find new sources of revenue. And, and that's, that's what we're going to have to talk about starting in January. Okay, I won't, I won't steal your thunder by asking you well, It's uh, not about chapter and verse. About, it's about trying to figure it out yeah. in a more detailed way. Yeah. Well, on that, on that subject, just to look at the, um, our, our city government system, um, you were the elected mayor, but you're one of a number of, uh, of city council f folks who have to make decisions, and we also have a, a city manager. Um, how's that working? I mean, it's, it, um, I know this came in in the early part 99. of last century. Well, but, but the reform movement oh, began oh, oh, this oh, way. Man. Yeah. Back in the so you don't you're not Fiorella Laguardia where you can put your fist down and say go over here and do that. Make this happen. You you it's about collaboration and uh, yeah. I, look, you're exactly right. This came out of the good government models yeah. and progressive government models that said having politicians, having elected people, run the day to day government means that you may get somebody who really doesn't know what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and really, you you get in politics too ingrained in all the decision making. So it's better to have a professional staff managing the business of government and have the elected officials set the policies and hire the, the, the head of that staff. Right. That's what we have in Pasadena and I think it serves us very well. We have a city manager form of government. He is the CEO uh, of our corporation, you know, yeah. of, of, our, of our city government corporation. Uh, the mayor's job is to be chairman of the board. Um, and the city council members are really all members of that board of directors. Right. In fact, until recently, that's what our city council was called, was a board of directors. Right. And it was really apt right. in a lot of ways. Right. So, so that um, it's descriptive of the process. The council has to be careful uh, not to overstep its bounds and um, direct staff people what to do. The staff does not work for the council. The staff are all hired by the city manager. We hire the manager, mm -hmm. but they report to the city manager. And we have to be, particularly as a, as a, a former department head in the city, as, the plan, as a former planning director, I have to remind myself of what my role is. It's not my role to call the planning director up 
and give him instructions. Right. You know, um, if I have a beef with the way something is happening at the in the planning department, my responsibility is to call the city manager and say, you know, from a policy point of view, I'm unhappy about the way this is yeah. working. And then it's up to him to uh, to fix that if if he thinks it needs fixing. Absolutely. But I think that that balance, which is constantly evolving and working, is is working very well. I think that the city council, my colleagues on the city council, uh, are really a devoted bunch, um, who are are very committed to the city, have a wide range of of expertise and life experience to bring uh, to bear, and the fact that I that I'm. I'm sure 90% of our decisions are unanimous, um, speaks volumes to the reality that the city, that the staff and the city manager have prepared the work uh, adequately and carefully. So by the time it comes to us, uh, the decision's pretty easy. Well, you know, kudos to, to, to you and to the other council members, because I know a number of council members and I know how hard they work and that most people don't realize the amount of time that it just <laughs> takes. Um, you know, the citizenry of Pasadena is very involved. I, 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 maybe it was you that made the comment that in some cities people uh, work hard when nine to five, they come home and they put their feet up and they uh, watch TV. In Pasadena, they work hard, they come home, maybe have a drink or something, and then head off to a meeting. And, uh, and it's quite true. But I think that's another strength of Pasadena in the sense that I think a lot of the job that, um, that you do and that the city government does is in collaboration with nonprofits, citizens group, other institutions, and you really can't do it, would you agree, without that oh, kind absolutely. of participation, the commissions, everything else. And, and that comment, that, with, with that story, which I often tell, came from a mayor of, an, of a nearby city. Uh, so it wasn't my, uh, <laughs> okay. it was his observation of the way it works really? in Pasadena, wow. yeah, which makes it even more charming. We I have wanted, a great I reputation. Divulge the city. But, but I, I, I don't think, know if he was being envious or being... Well, he was just, he was just <laughs> making an observation. Yeah. Uh, it makes it inconvenient sometimes. It makes yeah. it time consuming. And you can see that when the council gets too far out front on something, the citizens know how to reel us back in. And the, y, the YWCA controversy, where the council had made a decision... Uh, which it thought was considered and appropriate and was sticking with that decision um, until it got to the point where the where cit various citizens groups came to us and say, you know, you didn't do the right thing here and you booted it and you need to do it over. And we are. Well, this is, you know, this is how democracy ought to work. And uh, I think that it's, I think if we, as we see from the national political landscape, that um, that the that the uh, with do democracy in action really happens on the local level, and that's where people can really have an influence. If you're one person can make a big difference in this city, uh, if they're on a commission or if they attend a city council hearing, um, and it, we and in my view we have a very responsive uh, government. So oh, uh, congratulations look, I, to you on I that. Couldn't, I couldn't agree more, Hoyt, and I, I really think that um, that living in a city of this size, where you have access to your council member or your mayor on a first name basis and people as Maria will attest come up to me all the time you know at Vons or at Trader Joe's or or when we're walking in the Arroyo um, and we'll share what their thoughts are um, and I, I welcome that. Well I'm, I'm uh, glad you do and I'm, I really am delighted that you could come today and talk and good luck to you on the state of the city I hope everybody uh, watches and, and thank you so much for all that you do for our city. Terry. You're very welcome. It's a privilege. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This program was produced by Pasadena Media for the Arroyo Channel.